We are in a new series now. We're in the book of Judges. We finished off Joshua, and now we're in Judges. And uh, so this will be a series for a while. And uh, we, we started off with uh, uh, the people, uh, character lessons from uh, Genesis, and, and then we did Life of Moses, and then J- uh, Joshua. And so I guess uh, right in order there is the book of Judges. And uh, so um, let's go to Judges, and uh, let's look at uh, chapter 2. And uh, Judges and chapter 2. And uh, let's, we'll start at verse 10, and uh, we'll get uh, into this new series, give you a little background, and uh, we'll dig into this book. There's a lot in there. And uh, chapter 10 and verse 16, I'm sorry, chapter 2 and verse 10, sorry, and we'll go to verse 16. And also all that generation were gathered together unto their fathers, and, uh, and, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet his works which he had done in Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam. Uh, and uh, they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, of the gods of the people uh, that uh, were around, around them, and, uh, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against them. And he delivered them unto the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them, and sold them un, uh, into the hands of their enemies uh, round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the, the, of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said. And as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we are thankful for this uh, book of Judges. Lord, it's uh, some really practical lessons for, I believe, America today and for uh, many of us in our lives. And I pray that as we would uh, study this, you would bless and speak to our hearts. And we are grateful. Each one of us is grateful. Uh, like Ken, for just uh, taking care of us and helping us through uh, trials. Even though we have trials and burdens, you give us grace, and we're thankful. We pray now that the Word of God would uh, speak to us, and each person in here would be blessed as we study this book of Judges. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, This is uh, um, a pattern of the book here. Um, uh, Israel is going to be blessed by God. That's why they're there. Then they're going to make mistakes. Uh, eventually they're going to get so blessed that they just forget the Lord. They'll go into idolatry. And uh, after they go into idolatry, um, they will cry out to God, and God will send them a deliverer. And they will be delivered and blessed. And then they will get comfortable, and uh, and then they'll forget the Lord, and then they'll go into trouble and idolatry. Then God has to punish them, and then they call upon God because their, their lives are so miserable, and then God delivers them, and that is the pattern. Um, this book shows that a man is depraved and uh, that you know, left, left themselves. A man eventually goes in a long downhill slide and, uh, and uh, they will eventually um, uh, do wrong. And, uh, and it eventually goes downhill. Let's look at chapter 21 real quick, just as a, just a brief overview of what this book is about. It doesn't happen instantaneously. A godly, holy nation, a good nation, could uh, go um, and, and start leaving the Lord and still keep the morality that was bred into them by their parents and grandparents and, and, uh, and have morality for uh, a couple of generations. But eventually, um, man is depraved. And, uh, and uh, that, what I mean by that is man has a sinful nature, and the flesh is there, and the devil tempts, and the world is there, and eventually it drifts that slow downward thing, with exceptions to individuals here and there, but that's, um, but that's kind of our nature. If we were careless and just did what we wanted to do and what we felt like doing, over time you'd start to do the wrong thing. You don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm just going to go out and bless my enemies and be kind to everybody and let everybody else in in traffic. And, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and let my coworkers, you know, I'm going to do their job for them and be happy about it. It's just not our nature. 
our nature is to be self-centered and and sin and and lust and anger and a bunch of things and so it's in us and uh and so eventually we end up there chapter 21 in verse 25 in those days there was no king in israel every man did that which is right in his own eyes and so eventually what your eyes see is right is what you want to do <laughs> and uh and your eyes can be deceptive what i thought was right and wrong uh, when I didn't have the Lord and didn't have the Bible to guide me, um, I it was totally subjective. It was and a little bit of input from my friends, a little bit of input from the world around me, a little bit of you know this and that. It was just multiple things that were in there. Society in general, what the older people talked about, just a mix like most people of morality, what you watched on TV, and what got you get indoctrinated by all kinds of things in school and everything else, and and what is right and wrong. But um, it is subjective. And, uh, and uh, I could talk to you about a thousand illustrations in society, in different cultures, where they do things that they think are perfectly good and normal, and you would go, you do not. I can't believe you do that. And why? Because um, <clears throat> without some kind of rock, morality is subjective, except for what God put as a conscience in our heart. Okay, but uh, you can go back to all kinds of godless cultures and and see what they did and, and godless people and and godless religious people and see what they did. And you say, how can you do that? How can you do that to people? But um, but, uh, you know, it's 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 in, in man. And there, when you do what's right in your own eyes and what gets pushed into you, you just end up doing that. And uh, and so otherwise there'd never be a war because everybody say this is what's right. <laughs> right. Uh, you just everybody just say no. This is this is wrong. Uh, when right now, if you have you take Ukraine and uh, and Russia, you take uh, Israel and the Palestinian uh, and and Hamas, and you just both of them are saying no, we're right, and both of them are convinced they're right. Okay, that's because of subjective morality, and every man doing that which is right in his own eyes. I'm thank God we have the Word of God that gives us uh, that uh, that truth. This book shows us a lot. Although we see um, some overlappings from the previous lessons, and we'll see a little bit of from the book of Joshua, you'll see some overlaps in the points today. As we go forward, it'll be a whole new set of circumstances and people and, and, and things that are happening. And, uh, and there's a lot of lessons for us today, and, uh, and it'll be practical. And uh, this starts out basically when the tribes now, they, they, they conquered the promised land, for the most part, some of the people we'll get to didn't conquer everything. And now the younger generation is now in the promised land. They're, and now they're in their local areas. Okay, They've been, they, they all have their own areas for the tribes, and that's where we are. And uh, so let's just get to, into some points here and uh, give you a few things. Um, there is no clear, number one, there's no clear leader in the nation. Uh, but the nation wisely asked the Lord to guide them. Okay, now this is uh, <clears throat> this is so important because they start off well, um, and let's go to, back to chapter one, and I want to explain that to you because this I, I think that you can make the point that what a godless people do and what a godless nation does and what when you drift away from God you do, and people will. will the people will, will bring up decent arguments about, well, you know, these religious people did these bad things and these atheists are, are, have some morality and, and these other religions and these things. And, and all those things, there's legitimate things in that. But by the way, born again, Bible believing Christians have never been the persecutors or kill people and put them to, to, to the sword. Never. They were the ones being killed a lot of times. It was almost always the Catholic Church. There was some uh, uh, Christians. Uh, uh, some of the Calvinists did it and other, other people, and it was always wrong. It was always against love your neighbors yourself, and, and if you smite you on one cheek, give them the other cheek also. It was always against the Bible, okay? Um, but some people, see, evil people use whatever power is available. If it's nationalism, they'll use that. If it's race, they'll use that. If it's religion, they'll use that. Evil people pick up whatever hammer's available to go and take power and kill their enemies, okay and 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 so sometimes there's religion sometimes nationalism sometimes the good of the people okay look at communism and uh and 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 the french revolution or whatever you know um you can pick your 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 there's always 
whatever power is available, evil people, evil dictators and leaders will use those things. Okay, and uh, and and so um, that's what they do. And then, unfortunately, they get power in religion sometimes. Um, but uh, those things happen. Um, they start off good though, and why I say this is because they they start off asking God for wisdom. Why? Because they're fresh off Joshua, and Joshua had led them in a godly way. And so, you know, they were, they were lifted up morally, you know, and, and so they were up here. Joshua was pulling them, holding them up, leading them, guiding them. And you have that. That's why many times you're, you, you'll find just in America right now, you'll find the grandparents were very moral, you know, straight people, stayed married their whole life, no adultery, um, you know, uh, 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 and no drugs, uh, 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 were patriotic and loved their country and, and loved their society and wanted to be good neighbors and worked and uh, helped the society get better. And they were really moral people, went to church and believed in good things. Now, there's exceptions. Because why? Because um, there's always humans and humans always have a human, a bad nature. Their kids had to go to church as kids and then went to church some and they got older. Then they got older, then they got too busy and then they... Uh, they sometimes hit and missed on church, and uh, and then they would, you know, go sometimes. They brought their kids with them sometimes. Their kids didn't go to church very often, and their kids saw their parents that it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't God wasn't a proud of your life. It was just something you did sometimes on Sunday when you had times. And then those kids hardly ever went to church. Okay, that was my generation. Okay, uh, my generation. Uh, uh, I had boy in my circle of friends, you know, just say when I was a, a teenager, in my circle of friends, I had, uh, you know, let's say 15 circle of friends. I had one that was consistently go to church. He was a Catholic, and his parents were very straight Catholics. He wasn't the most moral guy, but his parents uh, were, and, uh, and, uh, and, and that was it. And the other ones, sometimes their, their parents take him on holidays. Uh, me, never, okay? And, and, and then um, that, to my generation, in, in this case, they, their kids didn't go to church at all, aren't saved, don't know about God at all, and, and are agnostic and atheists and skeptics and all kinds of things. Um, it just, it just that, that slide, that's natural because of human depravity. Okay? And it's really easy to say, my parents didn't think this is important, and you just say, so it's not that important, and so you just don't go at all. Instead of saying, you know what, my parents don't seem to put God first. I think I will put God first. And the kids say, I'm going to do that. They can, and it happens. It happened to me. Um, however, it doesn't always happen that way because it's, it's just not most of human nature to just do that. You need God convicted and God working in a life and some soul winner and some things to happen for God to do that. And so um, we had that. But they started off good because they were fresh off uh, this godly leadership and the battles and everything else and God working. And uh, chapter 1 and uh, verse 3, it says, And Judah said unto Simeon, his brother, uh, Come uh, uh, up with me uh, unto uh, my lot, where we, uh, we may fight against the Canaanites, and I will likewise go with thee unto the lot. So Simeon went with him. And Judah went up, uh, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites under their hand, and they slew uh, of them. Uh, in Bezek, 10,000 men. And they found uh, eight Adonai Bezek in Belak, and they fought against him. And they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Uh, but Adonai, Adonai Bezek uh, fled, and they pursued after him and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and uh, great toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings, having uh, their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their men under my table. And I... Uh, uh, their meat on my table, and I, uh, as I have done, so hath God required of me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. They got victory. They got victory. But you know what they did? Look at verse 1. And after the death of Joshua came to pass, the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go for us against the Canaanites first to fight against, uh, first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. You know, these, they, they, they started off good. They started off with victory. They had an evil enemy that was just a, a brutal guy and uh, coming against them. And they prayed and said, Lord, what shall we do? There is no Joshua anymore. There is no leader of the nation. 
and they prayed and asked God. And, uh, and because they asked the Lord for wisdom, God gave them wisdom. God wants to give us wisdom. And the nation asked for that. The James 1, 5, if any, if any among you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally. He just freely gives it. And it shall be given him. God wants to give you wisdom. He wants you to have direction. He wants you to know what to do. So he says, look, ask me. I'll give it to you. And Israel asked, and they got wisdom of how to fight this battle and who should fight. And they got the victory. He wanted to give them the victory. And he did give them the victory because they prayed about it. So the nation started off doing good. Again, they don't necessarily in the same way need a leader. They're not wandering through the wilderness. They're not coming out of Egypt. They're not crossing the Red Sea. They're not crossing the Jordan River. They're not fighting uh, uh, the, all these mighty nations. They're just in their local areas with local battles. But sometimes a nation would come against them to take to conquer the nation, and they need wisdom. Sometimes a region would get attacked. Sometimes uh, they would have a drought or a problem. And each one, they would need to seek God. And every year, they were supposed to come multiple times to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. They're required to come and keep God as a priority. And locally, they had Levites around them to worship God. They were supposed to be serving the Lord and doing that. So there wasn't as much of a need for a national leader except for occasionally a prophet to come along and lead them. Um, they were in the land. They were settled there forever if they wanted to be. And they had that. And so that's where they were. They didn't have to have that leader. And so they asked God because they had a battle, and God gave them wisdom. Number two, most of the tribes did not finish driving out all the inhabitants. Uh, let's look here in chapter 1 and verse 21. And the children of uh, Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites, that inhabited Jerusalem. And uh, so that's, uh, but David had to do that a lot longer uh, later. Um, you see, as, as we continue, um, look at verse, uh, let's see, 27. And uh, in, in, uh, in, in this chapter here, uh, neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth uh, Shean. Okay, um, but they, they didn't do that, and they left them there. And... Uh, and uh, uh, we can just keep on going through all these passages. It just, it just goes on and on. Neither did, verse 29, neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwell in Gezer. Now, this isn't they are there and this whole nation is there inhabiting the area. They just didn't drive all of them out. They just dwelt on these mountains over here. They couldn't get them any farther than that. They didn't, they didn't conquer them. They didn't push them all the way out. They didn't, they didn't totally remove them from the land. So they, were, they had a, a, fort, a, a fortress city over here, just a small area. But that was enough. Because when you leave those things in your life, they begin to influence other things. I think the biggest thing I ever see this in is anger and bitterness. I'll see someone get a lot of sin out of their life, you know, that are what we'd say are these, you know, uh, big uh, overt sins that are obvious, you know, the, 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 you know, drinking and smoking and chewing, you know, and, and running what those are doing. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and we see all those things, you know, they stop cussing, they come to church, they, uh, you know, they stop fornicating, they stop, you know, whatever they're doing, they're, they were stealing, they were lying, they were doing drugs, and, and the things that are just standing out there, but they keep some things inside of them, some unforgiveness, some bitterness, some anger, and they don't drive, while, while God's given victory and why they're really grown in their Christian life when they're coming into the land, and they let, they let that stay there. And all of a sudden, that anger that's there, it just starts being applied to something else. And they're angry at this person. Then they get angry at somebody at church. All of a sudden, they're angry at the pastor. And all of a sudden, they're not listening to the same of the sermons. And they get mad at God because God didn't answer their prayer and do this thing. And what? They left that thing in the land, that enemy, and that enemy begins to corrupt them. And pretty soon, they're all messed up and back where they were. And Israel's going to do that because now they have people who are going to teach them and say, hey, you know, they just run them in, in the, somewhere and they say, hey, you know, what is that God, by the way? What is it? Just what do you worship? I don't even understand. It's a little statue, right? Oh, actually... Balaam did this, and this is Balaam, and he did, gives you this, and people are worshiping, and this thing's happening. There's a story about a guy who worshiped Balaam, and this, and they start learning about him. And pretty soon, maybe God doesn't answer their prayers, and maybe they're not being blessed in a normal way. They'd like to be blessed, and all of a sudden, maybe I'll try Baal. And of course, Satan helps them. 
They go out and they pray. Man, I don't, I don't have a wife yet. No, no wife. Bail, give me a wife. And they pray. And all of a sudden, the devil says, hey, man, we're going to make progress here. Let's send this, this woman over along his way. We got control of her, right? Yeah. Okay, make her be real nice to him and go along and help him find her and get these two together. We're going to bring, and everybody's going to see this. And, and all of a sudden, that city starts talking about Baal. See, they let it stay. And it began to corrupt them. And, and these things begin to happen. That's why it says don't even speak about these things. It says don't learn their ways at all. Just, just go and grind everything. Their statues, grind in the powder. Knock these people all the way out of the land. Don't leave one of them. Just, just get them out. And get everything out and, 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 and keep them out. Because you don't want to learn their ways. They'll be a snare to you. And, uh, and, uh, and, and it happened all, all throughout this book. It really was a, uh, a big problem. We can go through all the way down to verse 30. Uh, 30 uh, six and show you um, that these people were all throughout the land. Um, and verse 30, just look at 35, but the Amorites would dwell in Mount Herez and uh, Adogen and all these other places. Uh, yet the house of Joseph prevailed so that they became tributaries. They weren't supposed to be tributaries. They weren't supposed to be dwelling there still because you're going to learn their ways. And God told them that and prepared them for that. The Lord is not happy with this disobedience, and there would be consequences. Chapter 2 and verse 1, And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal. To, remember, we just went through the passage where they, nevertheless, these, they didn't conquer these people. Nevertheless, these people still dwelt in the land. All the way through there, uh, down 33, 34. All these verses show the different tribes. Several tribes left people there. And the, an angel of the Lord came from Gilgal um, to Bochum and said, I... Uh, uh, I made you to go up, uh, up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swore unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And ye saw, uh, you sh and ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, and, and ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but ye shall be, they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass, and the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, and he would lift up their voices and wept. He says, you know, hey, I, I, I gave you a chance. I was giving you the victory. You got content with being good enough. And then you left this stuff here, and I am not going to fight and drive them out. I have drove them out supernaturally before you, but now I'm not going to do that anymore. You didn't obey my voice, and now they're going to be a problem, and you're going to suffer because of it. He wants us to go all the way to victory. Number three, most of the tribes did not fi finish, I'm sorry, number two, they did not finish out driving out the inhabitants. Number three, the older generation dies off, and the next generation had different challenges. All right? The older generation dies off, and the next generation had different challenges. Um, let's look at chapter 2 and verse, uh, uh, verse uh, 6. It says, And when Joshua... Uh, had had let the people had had uh, let the people go. The children of Israel went every man into his inheritance to possess the land, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works of the Lord that it is did in Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. They, and they buried him in the borders of the inheritance of uh, Timnaherez in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of um, the hill Gaash. And all, uh, all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he did for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. See, a lot of things happen there. First of all, it says Joshua passed away, and then there was a generation that was with Joshua. Remember, Joshua was older because Joshua was 40 when he went in the promised land, okay? And so when he went in the promised land and brought back the report as one of the spies, and so he was 45 years old at that time. Well, when he came back and the, the provocation happened in Numbers 14, um, Numbers 13 and 14, he went 
And, uh, and, and they, God said, hey, only Joshua and Caleb are going in, and everybody under 20 is, is, gonna, is, gonna, uh, is going to go in the promised land. But everybody over, over 20, you've, you've, you can't enter in. You're going to wear your wander till you pass away. And so Joshua was 25 years older than the oldest person in Israel. But those people who were very young and up to 20, they wandered for, for 40 years they saw the pillar of fire. They saw Israel win the battle. They saw um, uh, the hands held up and the, the battle won and the hands lowered. They saw the water from the rock and, and they saw <clears throat> um, the crossing of the Jordan. They saw Jericho fall. They saw the mighty works of the Lord. So that generation, after Joshua began to pass away and get older, and they continued on. And then what happened? Then there was a generation who were either little tiny children or not born yet, in the promised land, who grew up in the promised land, they didn't see any miracles, they didn't see any mighty works, they didn't need, need God to fight a supernatural battle, and they began to forsake God. And this brings up a few thoughts um, that, that I want to uh, give to you, and, uh, and uh, it, it, that are interesting. First of all, the older generation needed the Lord, and his miracles, so they saw the Lord work. They needed miracles. They needed the Lord. They had battles and challenges. And they saw the Lord work because God always comes through. This is why first generations normally are superior to the next second and third generation because the first generation christian needed god they had all this sin they god came to them and reached them miraculously and they saw god working and they begged god for help and they needed god's help and they had to have god's strength to deliver them for their sin next generation comes along and they don't have this deep dark sin they grew up in a christian home they didn't have to overcome. They didn't have to beg God for victory. They didn't have to go and, 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 and learn the Bible from scratch. They learned it in Sunday school. They just, they just started off that way. So they didn't learn how to fight in battle. They didn't need God. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't have to have, their, their worst sin was, you know, they, they steal cookies from grandma's cookie jar. But their dad, worst sin, was he was in jail, you know, for robbery. And he had to stop doing that. And he had to go, God, you got to deliver me. He had this incredible testimony, the miraculous transformation in his life. And he'd sing the things I used to do, don't do them anymore. And he was amazed, and he knew God was real. The kid who all he did is steal the cookies from Grandma's cookie jar, well, he's on a little different level. He's like, he didn't need to pray for victory, you know. His grandma whacked his hand, right? And he, he didn't have to, he, he got disciplined into it. He, didn't, he, he got purified as much as he did or she did because her, his parents made him do it. And that's good. Parents should make you do it. But where did he seek God and need God? Now, he should be a better Christian than his dad. His dad's got baggage. His dad's got things in his mind that shouldn't be there that he learned. His, he, he didn't have that pure start. He learned, his, he learned the Bible. The dad started learning the Bible at 30 or 35, and the kid learned the Bible at 4. He doesn't have a bunch of uh, uh, bad memories. He doesn't have a bunch of baggage. He doesn't have all those things. And, and so he should be a better Christian. And many times they are. Because, look, they started their race on the, you know, at the 50-yard line. <laughs> you know? But many times they don't seek the Lord. Many times they don't understand how real God is and how powerful God is. And many times they're not, uh, uh, they're not, they're not, not seeking God in that way. And, 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 and the second generation doesn't get that. Now they can't and they do. And some of the greatest Christians in history were second and third uh, generation Christians, right? Because uh, they, but they had to make a choice. And, and, and it's a little harder. And I'll give you some, some reasons why that. Um, the older generation needed the Lord and his miracles, so they saw the Lord work. The younger generation started in the promised land, and the fewer and smaller challenges, but were, but, uh, were, over, uh, were overcome. Isn't that strange? They didn't have the challenges and enemies and the battles, and yet they were overcome. You know, what's, you know why? Here's the thing. <laughs> oh, this is so true. Is... 
I was in the world until I was 16. I knew the world. I knew the emptiness of it. And when I got saved, I saw the world trying to draw me back into it. I knew the world, the, the world system, the sin of the world. I knew it was my enemy. The next generation comes in and says, what's wrong with the world? They haven't had to fight it. And Israel, they started befriending these nations, saying they aren't bad people. There's nothing wrong with them. They're just living on their mountain over there. Just they have children, kids. They have people or husbands. They're just people. And they're not so bad. You said those people are evil. They're not killing anybody. They worship their statues. Maybe there's something to their statues. And they get curious because they never had to fight their way out of there. They didn't understand <clears throat> just how wicked these people are. They didn't see the human sacrifice these people did. They didn't know that they sacrificed their babies. They, they burned their babies alive, right? There was a reason God said don't do that and stay away from them. And then they, they check it out. And so um, they, they already had that battle, and they knew about that. We often, secondly, um, first underneath this, the older generation dies off. The younger generation had different challenges. The older generation needed the Lord and his miracles. <clears throat> so we saw the Lord work. Secondly, we often have, uh, hate the struggles, but they can really help us. You know, one thing I always um, wanted for my kids to have, I wanted them to need God. So I wanted them to do ministry so they can need God because we need to need God. I wanted them to do ministry also because I wanted them to see the, the wages of sin and see what sin does in lives. <coughs> I, I, when I was, I remember as a baby Christian, I, I started meeting uh, Christians who grew up in Christian homes, Christian school kids, and I started seeing them. And I thought, Goodness, these kids do not know how good they have it, and they're, they're pulling toward the world. Man, I'm pulling away from the world. And in my, I mean, baby, baby Christian thought, I thought, I am not going to teach my kids about God and let them find out about God after they've experienced some sin, because otherwise you're just going to go and try it like these kids want to do so bad. Now, I know it's foolish. I didn't know how the wisdom, but I had to knowledge understand They've got to understand the world and sin is harmful and evil and against God, and, and it's not said to be tinkered with. And once you have it, you have to fight it the rest of your life. Once, you, once, you, once you've let the evil in, you always say, those, oh, no, there's, I, oh, no, I, I want to bow down to that idol. I thought I got rid of all of them, but, man, that really was. You're, you have baggage. It's harder. And, 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 and most of our church is first-generation Christians, so a lot of you are all nodding and know this stuff. And you couldn't even say, man, if I could have grown up in a Christian home like the kids in the church, my life would have been so much better. But then you might have been retarded like those kids get and said, man, yeah, you guys just say that you don't understand how awesome the world is. I see it on the commercials. Yeah, every, yeah, the guy who sits here and drinks Budweiser it, is a big strapping guy with muscles with a girl hanging on each arm. That's the way it is in a bar, right? Stand outside a bar and watch the guys coming out and look and see the women look like that and see if the men look like that and see if he's got a man on each arm. No, he's got a big fat beer belly and uh, it's not, that's not life. They show you the, the fun drink and they don't show you the hangovers. Okay, it's an advertisement. It's it's fake. It's the word that the, and and so, but but it, it, the the battles do us good because we need the Lord. We need Him. We need to be drawn to God. We need to trust Him. And I'm telling you, I'm not saying, boy, a lot of second and third generation Christians are just so awesome and done so well. Um, these two down here, for example, I mean, just you know, awesome. And uh, you know, one of them, they 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 came from amazing homes with amazing parents and uh but but uh but you know a, a lot of kids did right and 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 praise god they have a big advantage 
and 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 you know people who go through a lot of battles got have wounds and scars and 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 uh and aches and pains you know and and th stuff like that from going through all of it man it's it's better not to have all that i'm glad we've got people in our church who've been married three times and now four times and i think one time one case five times but then now they have a good marriage but they have some bad stuff behind them I'm glad, that, I'm glad they got saved and learned how to be married and are doing well and praise the Lord. But it's a lot better to have one good, happy marriage your whole life. Okay? And, and it's a miracle that person is happily married. Praise God. And they know God's real because they know they have a happy marriage now for once. That's amazing. Praise God. But you're better off meeting the person, the love of your life, and staying married your whole life and having a happy marriage your whole life. Okay, and 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 knowing that God's real because He's He's involved in your marriage. Okay, and and so you have that. And uh, man, I got to finish up. Um, <clears throat> um, we often hate the struggles, but they can help us. Uh, underneath that, we are uh, we see the Lord working to deliver us and give us strength. His strength is made perfect in weakness. Second Corinthians chapter uh, twelve, verse seven through ten says, "He said, Glad, I will glad therefore glory in my infirmities, the power of Christ may rest upon me.' I'm so happy that I've got this burden because God has given me strength through it, and God's working, and I will be glad and glory in my infirmities because when I'm weak, then am I strong. These battles and burdens and weaknesses give us a chance to see God working in our lives." No matter what level of Christian we are. And um, <clears throat> also, we become stronger and purified. There's so many verses in this Romans 5, 3, and 4. Tribulation worketh patience, patience, experience, experience, hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is spread abroad in our heart. Uh, James talks about this, and there's so many passages about the power of a trial. Job 23, and when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. So these trials, though we don't like them, we want everything to go smooth, understand the people who experience God coming to the promised land, across the Red Sea, and coming out of Egypt, and everything else, they knew God was real, and they saw God, saw God working, and they had a, a closer walk, and it made them better. The soft generation who grew up in the promised land, where their parents already fought the battles, they got conquered by just little tiny things, because they never learned to fight. And they never learned that God's real. And they never knew how real he was. And so the other gods seemed tempting to them because they never needed God. You need to need God. And when God puts you in a place in your life where you need God, thank him. Because you need to need God. You need to experience God. You need miracles. I thank God this church needs God all the time. And we, we push and we, we follow God's leadership. And we see we have to have God come through and give us miracles. So our young people can see that God is real. Amen. We have to have that. I wrote this quote down. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men Create hard times. That's where we're heading right now, just so you know. G. Michael Humph uh, said that. Number four, Israel did not, did evil in the sight of the Lord and were punished, and then the Lord had mercy. We read that, I did this over and over. Um, this is no pattern to live by. Be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You just are stable. You're planted by God. You're bringing in the life and the fruit of God comes forth in your life. You're not unstable going away from God as soon as, because as soon as God would go, they would, and deliver them. He would send a judge. That's why it's called judges. They would fall away from God. God would send an enemy or let their enemies conquer them. And then they would be conquered. And then when the enemy conquered them, they'd cry and say, Lord, help us. We need you. We didn't realize how good it was to be underneath you. And God would say, okay, send a judge. A judge that had the power of God. They would, God would deliver them from their enemies. <clears throat> they'd get the victory. And they would thank the Lord. And then everything would be good and smooth for a while. Then all of a sudden they'd say, yeah, we don't really have to pray. We don't have any enemies. Our life's smooth. We already destroyed those enemies. Let's relax. 
you know what? We don't need to serve the Lord. We don't need to pray. We don't need to walk with God. We don't need this stuff. You know what? And those other gods are pretty interesting. Then they go, and all of a sudden, they'd forsake the Lord. The enemies would come. They would be conquered. Lord, help us. We didn't realize we shouldn't have forsaken you. We need your help. This is not what we thought it was. The world wasn't as good as we thought. <clears throat> the sinful life wasn't good as we thought. Lord, deliver us. Help us, Lord. And God's merciful. And he sent a judge and deliver them. And all of a sudden, the good times had come when their enemies were defeated and God blessed them and they'd start serving God. Then all of a sudden, it's really easy and nice and we don't have any battles. We don't have to pray. Why should they go to Jerusalem to worship? And they would, there would go again. That is not a way to live. And if you live that way, I'll just say, because God loves you and he wants you to live for eternity and he wants you to have eternal rewards. He wants you to be happy for all eternity and he's got to draw you back. If you are that person and that's your nature, whenever God has made everything smooth and easy for you, and you don't even have to pray about anything and you forsake God, God's going to just eventually say, and I've seen this, you know what? You just need hard times the rest of your life. You need things unsettled. You need things not answered because you keep praying when you do that. I prefer to be just like, this is awesome, God. I like it right here. You're amazing. Hey, you know what? I'm going to really praise you and stay here because I love you because you bless me. And you know what? I'm just, I'm going to pray anyway. I don't, I don't have any emergencies or anything, but I just want to pray and tell you I love you since I don't have to pray. God's going to like, hey, man, I'm going to bless this guy. This is a good place here. I, I, I would, I'd rather be the person bringing money to the commissary than the person who's saying, hey, can somebody bring me money in the commissary at jail? I, I would just rather not have to have God bring me back to him because I forsook him, because he blessed me. Uh, and, and so that's the book of Judges. It gets frustrating as you read it. You're like, oh, can't you learn anything from the last generation? No. Humans the only thing we learn from history is we never learn from history. <clears throat> All right? And so um, uh, learn that, okay? And if you're the blessed to be a second generation, or third generation Christian, look, believe your parents' stories and don't listen to the wooing of the devil and go into the world. Amen. And, and, and stay, be a tree planted by the rivers of water. All right, we've got to pray and be dismissed. Father, I didn't get a chance to teach a little bit about the introduction of the book of Judges. Help us as we go into it. Speak to our hearts and, and help us to hear from you. Help us to be wise, whether we're the, the, the Christian who uh, sometimes goes back on you and everything's good, or whether we're the Christian who uh, it was blessed to not have the world in our lives. May we stay right there in Christ. And uh, Lord, may we be strong and need you and uh and uh keep on staying close to you we pray uh for for that we just draw near to you in jesus name amen